welcome all as we've seen that the attendees are gradually trickling in we'll just give it a couple more minutes before we start and we are all set to go speakers and panelists are in the house but we give it one more minute for more attendees to join Okay, that minute has passed. Thank you all for joining. While the attendees trickle in gradually, our panelists and speakers are ready. Welcome to this webinar on finance and plastics. My name is Jan Raas, and I'm the finance and plastics lead at UNEP Finance Initiative. We thank you for being with us, for spending your valuable time with us. Um, you have joined the webinar with an official title called Unlocking Finance to Advance a circular economy for plastics. And we share with you our in insights and um, some new tools for financial decision makers. This webinar is co-hosted by the Global Plastic Action Partnership, convened by the World Economic Forum, by the Circulate Initiative, and by UNEPFI in full the United Nations Environmental Programme Finance Initiative. We are today, Tuesday, 7th of November, and the duration of the webinar is 75 minutes. So please bear with us as we take you along in the world of finance and plastics. So to give you an overview of the session, we have um, soon to come Juliet Cabrera on behalf of Rwanda who will be opening, um, who will do the opening remarks. Uh, but in this session, you will hear examples on how finance both public and private can play its role to end plastic pollution and not to contribute to it. So all speakers and panelists share this common vision of the future. One, they work on facilitating systematic change across the entire plastics value chain. And second, they work on redirecting financial flows towards building a safe circular plastics economy. And before we hear more from our speakers and panelists, I would like to share with you some of the reasons that create the urgency why we are here and um, why we need system change rather than the global financial sector adhering to the business as usual situation. So foremost, there is obviously the context of the future plastics instrument that is being negotiated and that is expected to change the rules and to cover the entire life cycle of plastics on a global scale, which has never been done before. There is some regulation, but that is regional and there is lack of global reg regulation. Hence, we need a future plastics instrument. And according to recent scenario modeling, stronger public policies around the globe have the potential to significantly reduce the annual mismanaged plastics volumes by at least 90%. By the year 2040, so that's a time-bound horizon that the negoci negotiators are working towards. But to put these poli policies into action and, and work towards system change, is a substantial financial investment is required, and that runs in the trillions of dollars, US dollars, between 2025 and 2040, while there is no reason to wait. Financial institutions can start now by redirecting financial flows because to achieve systemic change by 2040, this requires a massive redirection of financial flows. Hence, we are talking about trillions, not billions. And very evidently, a collaboration between private and public actors is key to mobilize financial resources from all sources. 
Now, our first speaker is Juliette Cabrera. Juliette is the Director General of the Rwanda Environment Management Authority. And in 2008, Juliette was involved with creating the Rwanda law uh, that imposed a ban on plastic bags. Actually, that was followed 10 years later by a, another Rwanda law imposing a ban on single-use plastics. So she has quite a track record in environment and plastics. And Juliette will be talking about the following items. She will reflect on IC3, which is the third round of negotiation to come to a globally binding legal instrument or a legally binding instrument on plastics on a global scale. She will also talk about the role of finance. Um, she will tell us about Rwanda Green Fund, which in fact is the largest environmental financial facility on the African continent. Without further ado, I give the floor to Juliette Cabrera. Juliette, please take it away. Thank you so much for the kind invitation and thank you for hosting me. I'm glad to be here. Good morning and greetings from Kigali, Rwanda. It's a pleasure to be with you today to discuss the role of finance and advancing a circular economy on plastics. Indeed, finance will play a critical role in the successful implementation of the Global Plastic Treaty to enable countries to meet their commitments under the treaty. We will need to unlock adequate funding to support initiatives and activities that reduce plastic pollution. The most recent estimates indicate that advancing global efforts to address plastic pollution will necessitate a significant investment of approximately $17 trillion. The vast majority, just over $15 trillion, will need to come from the private sector, for which we as governments need to establish the necessary rules and incentivize and catalyze, including through a global plastic treaty. The remaining $1.5 trillion is expected to come from the private sector, from the government, from, from the public sector, sorry. This implies that governments will need to invest approximately $100 billion annually. As we are calling for the first draft of the treaty uh, to be considered at INC3, it's the right time to discuss how best to realize the funding, the funding needed to achieve the objectives of the Global Plastic Treaty. The Zero Draft presents various options related to financing, which is in part three of the Zero Draft for those of us who have gotten a chance to look at it. The first of two sections deals with financing and primarily addressing institutional aspects. It explores the possibility of creating a newly established dedicated fund and also considers the alternative of establishing a dedicated fund within an existing financial arrangement, such as the Global Environment Facility. The question that immediately comes to my mind is, can the current financial mechanisms adequately support the treaty, providing the necessary financial resources as stated, to empower its parties to fulfill their responsibility outlined in the treaty. All those are questions that we should that should that should be running in our minds as we prepare to go uh, for the INC3 and uh, and even after. Achieving this goal may only be possible if the treaty incorporates provisions of establishing a dedicated New, new multilateral fund with the foresight to supplement it with additional funds in case the newly established fund falls short of, uh, short of reaching its anticipated targets with its own governing body. In addition to the suggested new fund, the treaty should, should include provisions setting responsibilities to primarily plastic polymer producing countries. It should also encourage countries to implement control measures that require private companies involved in, plast in plastic production to contribute towards creating a plastic pollution-free environment. Allow me to share two practical examples from my country. 
In Rwanda, we banned plastic bags in 2008 and single-use single plastics in 2019. And this law is now being implemented. However, we know that there are some instances where there are no alternatives to single-use plastics and importing them is required. In other words, exceptional we accept, we give we permit exceptional use of uh, single use plastics wherever we don't have alternatives that is why rand environment management authority teamed up with the private sector federation to establish a dedicated fund to manage plastic waste when a company requests for special authorization in their transition uh, to alternative packaging solutions they are required to pay a levy and the funding has enabled us to set up a plastic collection scheme. Since the scheme was introduced, our local recycling partner, EnviroServe, has collected almost 1,500 1, tons of plastic waste that would have otherwise gone to landfill. Notably, we learned that the financial contributions made by businesses to address plastic waste are significantly different from the actual cost involved. Nevertheless, the fund is operational and businesses are willing to support the cleanups of plastics from the environment, even if additional contributions are required from the government. A second example is the Rwanda Green Fund, which you have already alluded to, which invests in a wide range of projects and initiatives that align with Rwanda's climate and sustainability goals. This fund is now the largest national environment and climate change investment fund in Africa and has mobilized over $247 million for 46 projects, which have created more than 175,000 green jobs. One of the key priorities of the Rwanda Green Fund is advancing waste management and the circular economy, including for plastics. We are trying to transition away from the waste dumping and open landfill, which is currently uh, where 95 per, 90% of all the waste in Rwanda ends up. The Rwanda Green Fund is about to kick off an incubation program for the circular economy that saw more than 250 companies and entrepreneurs apply. And so we know there are solutions out there. Thank you, Juliet. Actually, um... this experience has taught us the importance of having nationally led responses to environmental challenges like the levy and the Rwanda Green Fund. While the financing needed to beat plastic pollution by 2040 might be large in scale, the success of these efforts will come down to local systems and institutions being able to deploy finance and capital at speed and scale to both public and private responses. We hope the Global Plastic Treaty will reflect this in need uh, in the final draft of the text. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you, Julia. Thank you for your contribution. And um, for the audience, Rwanda, together with Norway, is presiding the High Ambition Coalition of Member States to End Plastic Pollution. And thank you, Juliette, for setting the scene, for your opening remarks. Very valuable how Rwanda is working on imposing bans and also looking at opportunities uh, to leverage finance, public finance, um, via the Rwanda Green Fund. So, good story. Um, now, we are going to our uh, speakers uh, that will introduce the showcases to us. The first speaker will be Umesh, Umesh Madhavan, Research Director at the Circulate Initiative. Hang on, Umesh, before you start. I will introduce the other cases so the audience knows what's coming. So Umesh will be talking about the Plastic Circularity Investment Tracker that has gone global. It used to cover Asia, 39 countries, and now it went to a global coverage, which means that it tracks 
many more investments around the globe. And Umesh will tell us about that. After Umesh, we will hear the story from Rogin Green from the World Economic Forum, who is the co-head of the Global Plastic Action Partnership. And she will share a case study on how to unlock finance for a plastic circular economy. And the showcase, the last one, is actually talking about the paper that directly talks about redirecting financial flows to end the plastic pollution. And that is presented by Joost van Dunn, who has a double hat today, speaking on behalf of ING and the Finance Leadership Group on Plastics. So without further ado, um, please audience bear with us. Um, the first of the three showcases is presented by Umesh Madafan from the Circulate Initiative. Umesh, please take it away. Thank you, Anne. And uh, thank you, Juliet, for the insightful opening to the webinar and highlighting the need for catalyzing finance for the successful implementation of the instrument. So as Ian mentioned at this webinar today, I'm delighted to launch our global edition of the Plastic Circularity Investment Tracker. I also share some key insights that we have gleaned by putting together this uh, data. So let me jump straight in. So to give you a bit of context, um, we launched the Plastic Circularity Investment Tracker earlier this year to address one of the key data gaps in tackling the plastic pollution challenge. And this was the absence of or the trans lack of transparency on private capital flows into solutions that drive a circular economy for plastics. So in the absence of that information, investors did not know, private investors in particular did not know if this was an investable space. And on the other end of the spectrum, investees or businesses who are seeking capital were not aware whom to approach for monies that they needed to grow and scale the business and tackle the pollution challenge. So it was this that led us to launch the investment tracker initially for emerging markets. Um, so the first edition of the investment tracker that we launched covered 38 countries um, in emerging markets. And now we have gone global with the data, with uh, data track for over 91 countries globally. You know, of the obvious question is what is the research methodology and how the data was compiled. So for tracking and, and reporting on this information, we reviewed more than 15,000 prior investment transactions for their relevance to drive a circular economy for plastics. Now, having to review transaction by transaction from various databases that we had consulted, including conversations that we had, some conversations that we had, we filtered that list down to 3,700 deals, which we believe have a direct role in driving a circular economy for plastics. So that information that we've aggregated on a deal level is now reported and available, and I'll share the QR code to the investment tracker at the end of this uh, presentation of mine. You can slice and dice the data by total investments. You can see the investments which have been made for the global regions, Asia, Europe, North America, Latin America, and the Caribbean, and so on. You can see that information on a country level. You can also see that information across the plastics value chain in terms of solutions which prevent and reduce plastic to downstream plastic waste management. And I'll share some insights from that today. And you can also see information by investment category, how much of the money is coming through, say, for example, as an accelerator incubator financing. Like Juliet mentioned that in Rwanda, they're trying to promote early stage and startup organizations. So how much of that money is going through early stage organizations, such as through grants? How much money is coming through, say, debt financing by banks or through sustainability-linked bonds and sustainability-linked loans? Or how much of it is through M&A and mergers and acquisitions and so on? So this new edition uh, has quite a few uh, firsts and new features. Uh, like I said, we have expanded the coverage to provide data for 91 countries where we have tracked transactions. Um, there's a comparison, data comparison feature, which is really useful to use. And, and if you want to just look at say all ASEAN markets and see what investments have gone into Southeast Asia. So pre-fill reuse investments, private investments in Indonesia versus India versus Thailand between 2020, 2018 and 2021, you can filter that data. Likewise, if you want to compare across investment types, that option is available as well. And finally, one, one of the new features that we've added to this investment tracker is what we call an investor profile module. So we profiled 24 leading investors, global investors who have put their money, private investments into plastic circularity in the hope that this becomes a first conversation for connecting and building that bridge between investors and businesses seeking capital. Next slide, please. So 
Here I'm going to share, I've just got three slides or four slides. I'll share some key takeaways from uh, the investment tracker. And then happy for you to sign up on the website so that once we release this report as well, you can uh, have access to that. So based on that filter, 3,700 transactions, which we captured, the investment tracker reveals that 360 billion in private investments were made in plastic circularity solutions between 2018 and the first six months of 2023. So how does that compare? 160 billion is really a big number and it's difficult to make sense of that. So when annualized, so if you were to look at this data on an annual basis, it's about 29 billion US dollars, which are being uh, private, which are being invested in plastic circularity every year during that period from 2018 to 2022. And what is that gap? So the gap, if you were to go back and look at a 2020 report, which stated systems change scenario and an 80% reduction in plastic pollution by 2040, that meant that we needed 60 billion. We needed 60 billion to actually fix that financing gap, as opposed to private investment. That included public and private, to be transparent about that data. But if you look at purely private investments alone, it's only 29 billion. And it's not just the 29 billion that needs to be kept in mind, but also where that money is going to, what are the solutions which are receiving the money and so on. Very quickly, in terms of the trend of the data, you can see that um, across the review period, uh, the, the, the investments peaked in 2021. This was primarily due to a certain transaction where uh, New Suez was formed with investments coming through uh, from a consortium of companies. Uh, but on average, like I said, it's 29 billion. And most recently in 2022, you've seen that investments have slightly dropped off uh, from the high of 2020 and 2021. Next slide, please. Now, like I said, um, one of the features of the investment tracker is for you to slice the data by region. So I've, I've provided insights on a regional level, but um, obviously you can do the same analysis on, on a, a country level as well. So if you look at how that $160 billion were distributed geography, geographically, it's no surprise that 90% of that money went to North America and Europe. These are developed economies, firstly, which offer a stable and investment and supportive policy environment. These are also markets which generally have a well-established waste management and recycling infrastructure. But if you go and compare that with the statistics around where is the problem the most severe, where is plastic pollution issue the most severe, where does the highest leakage occur, that is actually in emerging markets. So if you look at Asia and other regions such as Africa and Latin America, which are typically regarded as the hotspots for plastic pollution, they received very little investments. So Asia received about 8% of the total 160 billion that I mentioned. Latin America and Caribbean followed with 2 billion investment. These are all private investments. And if you look at Africa, it's a concern because they've really received 0.09% or 150 million in private investments cumulatively between 2018 and for six months of 2023. So there's a case in point here where we need to remember that we need to start looking at, uh, Jan mentioned about redirecting capital flows. I'd say we need to start looking at redirecting capital flows towards emerging markets where the pollution, where the issue is the most severe and where that money is most needed. Can you move on to the next slide? Now, another way to approach the data is to look at the whole plastics value chain. So if you look at that image or the chart on that um, slide, all the way from what we define generally as upstream solutions, alternatives to plastics, um, including material alternatives, redesign, refill and reuse solutions, and downstream solutions such as recovery and recycling. So when we looked at where that private investment had taken place over the period, um, cumulatively, we realized that 85% of that money has gone into recovery and recycling or downstream plastic waste management. Now, if you compare that with technologies which are focused on reduction or avoidance of plastics, such as alternative materials, redesign, refill and reuse, that's only 12% of the total investments, which all of those upstream solutions received. So the current approach and, and the current money flows actually towards um, plastic waste management. It is not to say that plastic waste management actually needs and downstream solutions need that money. It is critical that we address that, but at the same time, we need to start thinking how can we drive more capital to reduction and reuse? And that would need supportive policies, that would need supportive infrastructure, and that would obviously need a change in consumer behavior from all of us included. So next slide. So in, in, in conclusion, I'll, I'll wrap up my uh, presentation with three broad takeaways. Um, firstly, like I said, I think there is, an, and it's an obvious need 
for more capital. The current flow of capital is insufficient. Um, we need to ensure that there is better regional distribution of the capital. So this is, again, private investments that I've been talking about. And we need to make sure that capital is needed across the value chain. Now, we need money, obviously, in waste management, and we need man money in recycling as well. But we need to also start thinking, how do we direct more capital flows towards preventing the problem than managing it once it occurs? Next slide. And I'll just wrap up. But so if you are interested um, in checking out the tracker, I have provided a QR code to the tracker. So happy for you to explore it. Um, we should be releasing some of these highlights I mentioned um, in, in, in a day or two. So if you sign up on our website uh, for that, happy to send that email and the report as well once we publish. So, and with that, I come to the end of my presentation. Yeah, and I'd like to pass the flow back to you. Thank you, Umesh. What a great contribution. Actually, the money not flowing in the right direction entirely, and your tracker sheds light on that. So that creates the urgency to actually start to work in the financial sector. Um, and in, data is very important. So please keep up the good work and great that you are global now instead of uh, covering only Asia, which was a great start and has inspired many. Um, we are now going to listen to our next speaker, who is Rulgine Green from the World Economic Forum, and she represents the Global Plastic Action Partnership. And Rougine has a background in sustainable strategy, and she will um, address us and talk about a case study on investment. Rougine, please take it away. Great. Thank you so much, Jan. Um, and good morning and good afternoon um, to everybody on the line today. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I think we've heard from Jan and Juliet the very clear need for a massive redirection of capital flows. And Umesh did a fantastic job there of really showing that there is that gap and that there's insufficient uh, private investment into the, plastic, the circular plastics economy. Um, so I'll take a couple of minutes now just to share the experience and the learnings that we have at the Global Plastic Action Partnership. Uh, just to share a little bit about us, the Global Plastic Action Partnership is based at the World Economic Forum, and we're a multi-stakeholder partnership that helps connect the public sector, the private sector, and civil society, and really look to support impactful and tangible collaborations that accelerate this transition that we're all driving for to a circular plastics economy. And we do a lot of this work through our national partnerships, the real kind of engine of the GPAP work by supporting them to make evidence-based decision-making by creating national multi-stakeholder platforms, developing insights, action roadmaps, national finance roadmaps, and coordinating action and implementation. And I'm already very excited to see how they can take the work that Umesh just shared there from the Circulation Initiative and start to actually look at that in some of our national partnerships as well. And then at a global level, we're growing a community of practice to share some of our learnings and these practical examples. Um, and I'll take a kind of share some of those with you today as well. In terms of financing in particular, at the forum, we like to take that bigger systems perspective to uncover what's needed for an enabling environment, to identify barriers to investment and highlight some of these emerging opportunities. Um, and we're grateful, actually, the Circulation Initiative also partner with us um, as a key thought partner and on some of the research that we've been doing in the last 12 to 18 months um, to identify what are the the different um, barriers to investment and, and what are those emerging opportunities. Um, and we really want to identify some concrete examples. I think it's great to have all of this data and evidence, but actually what does this look like in reality and how can we kind of turn that into something tangible? And I think Juliet's done a great job of that this morning as well of showcasing the uh, Rwandan example. Um, and something that's important to us as well, especially in now light of the treaty, I feel like now is the time to move these conversations beyond these broad statements into specifics and into actions. And hopefully this evidence and these examples can help us to do that. So the case studies that I'm about to share, they're really targeted at the financial sector audience, helping to visualize what is the business case to understand what is possible, um, but also to understand what is profitable as well, because that's important um, to make these real tangible examples. So we've created also a dedicated policy to make a supplement um, so that governments can understand kind of what's needed from that policy environment. And that's something that we really want to do at GPAP is to support governments, to support the, support the financial um, financial system as well, and kind of the whole system um, to help create this kind of evidence base. Um, so from the case studies, if we can move to the next slide, 
and we've devised, derived four key learnings um, that we'd like to share with you today. And we'll keep it relatively high level. Um, the first of these is around the role that governments can play, um, and that's really um, kind of all levels of government in order to catalyze investments in the circular economy. And this looks at three key things. Um, one is creating a cohesive ecosystem um, for plastic circularity, incentivizing investments, and then thirdly, re reducing or sharing the risk um, of these investments. Secondly, we look at how to um, boost demand um, for these pieces. And I think that's where really the role of brands and strategic investors come in to be able to have that additional um, demand in, in addition then to the, the policies and the regulation. And I think really if we're looking at the PET recycling supply chain, this is a great example of where demand has really increased. And then we've got a great example from Mexico as well um, in our case studies, if you're looking for some more um, specific examples there. Thirdly, we're looking also at the role of impact-focused strategic and concessionary capital sources. So when we have pioneering companies and governments, this additional um, capital sources really help to drive that early stage investment into downstream and upstream solutions. Um, and in particular, SMEs benefit from this type of collaboration. Um, so they have that de-risk financing, but also then the technical assistance to scale. Um, and these catalytic investors and blended finance structures then help to prepare a pipeline for later stage investment, hopefully coming in, in the near future. And then finally, uh, our fourth, fourth learning comes back to the role of governments again. Um, and that's really the role that they can play in the development of domestic capital markets and through issuing green bonds and loans. And I think there's also a lot to be learned in terms from other sectors and climate, for example, for so many great learnings that we can take on board when we're thinking about plastic circularity. If you can move to the next slide, please, as well. I'd like to share just kind of one more specific example um, in terms of this domestic capital markets. Um, and again, Juliet shared the great example from Rwanda taking leadership in Africa. And I think in terms of um, other examples, the government of Indonesia are also playing um, a really interesting role um, in the way that they're setting this up as well. So the Indonesian government, they sought to foster private sector involvement in raising capital for green infrastructure, including waste management. So in 2018, it launched the world's first green sukuk bond. Um, has since become one of the world's pro, uh, most prolific green bond issuers, issuers as well. Um, and this gr green sukuk framework now totals approximately $4.3 billion and includes some waste and management projects in this as well as part of that bro broader green framework. Um, they're also now looking at um, SDG bonds um, and really starting to yeah, have kind of a leadership position um, in this space. Um, and also I'd like to mention that the Indonesia um, government partnered with GPAP for one of their, their national partnerships there and are really proud um, of the work that they are doing in Indonesia um, on all fronts um, to tackle plastic waste and pollution. Um, so if you're interested in these case studies, I'm afraid we'll, I'll add to your homework from, uh, from the, the webinar today. Um, we can share the link to some of these case studies um, in the exam, in the, in the chat below. Um, but maybe a kind of a, a final reflection um, is one on just that it is this incredible moment of opportunity. Um, and that's an opportunity to stop plastic pollution through the, the Plastics Treaty. Um, and we'll be in Nairobi next week um, for the negotiations. But that's also opening doors as a business opportunity. And that includes new opportunities um, for, for financial institutions as well. So hopefully between this extra evidence and the case studies, we can start to see where those opportunities are and turn those into action. So thank you so much. Over to you, Jan. Thank you, Rogine. That was insightful. And um, in the interest of time, we're continuing with our next uh, speaker, that is Joost van Dan, who speaks on behalf of ING as the Director of Sustainable Finance and Circular Economy. And he is also a representative of the Finance Leadership Group on Plastics, convened by UNEPFI. Joost has a background in innovation finance and he will present to us the insights from the paper that was freshly published last week with the title Redirecting Financial Flows to End Plastic Pollution. So without further ado, please take it away, Joost. Yeah, thank you, Jan, very much for this introduction. Good morning, good evening, everybody. And also thank you for the previous speakers to share your interesting views, experience, and learnings. Um, indeed, 
My name is Joost van Dun, uh, working as Circular Economy Lead in uh, Sustainable Finance, but today here to uh, present to you, to give some more color on the work we have done with the UNEPFI Finance Leadership Group on Plastics. Well, who is this uh, leadership group? Uh, the group consists of a core group of banks and insurers from different continents with total assets of almost $10 trillion. The leadership group is convened by UNEPFI to contribute from a financial institution perspective uh, to the development uh, of the international legally binding instrument focusing on ending plastic waste, but also to build awareness and readiness in the finance sector to respond to this future instrument through uh, financing and investments. Our vision in the end is to contribute to a thriving, just a safe circular plastics economy without plastic pollution achieved, and as already mentioned many times today, achieved to massive redirection of financial flows. If we can go to the next slide, please. Um, ahead of the previous uh, round of negotiations for the uh, future plastic instrument, so that was INC2, the working group already uh, developed and formulated 10 key messages, which you can see here on the screen. Uh, the main key messages we want to get across are, and the most important one is to align financial flows from all sources, so public and private, with the overarching uh, objective of the financial instrument. Uh, this objective would really emphasize the key role that public and private finance play in addressing the issue of plastic pollution, but it would also give a string, strong signal to them uh, that they will be expected to actually reorient the financial flows. And on the other hand, also to the member states uh, that they will need to establish the required enabling environment uh, to realize this. Um, aligning uh, financial flows uh, with the overarching objective of the financial instrument, of, sorry, of the, of the uh, plastic instrument, is also done uh, through Article 2.1c of the Paris Agreement and also uh, with Goal D of the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework. And we would like to do that here in the same way, on the one hand, uh, because it is proven effective, uh, but if we wouldn't mention it and if we wouldn't align the financial flows with the overarching objective of the instrument, uh, we would give perhaps the wrong signal that plastics is of a lower priority than climate and biodiversity, which is obviously not the case. So that was the first key message. The second key message is uh, that we want to create an obligation to create a mandatory framework and environment that will enable the alignment of financial flows, such as increasing financial flows from all sources to uh, activities which have a positive impact on ending plastic pollution and decreasing financial flows from all sources which contribute to plastic pollution. But to realize this, uh, we have also defined the enablers, and these are the other uh, seven key messages uh, which the treaty should include. Uh, such as, for example, I won't mention them all, uh, all 10 of them, uh, but such as clear definitions on activities which have a positive impact on plastic pollution. But for example, also mandatory disclosure of plastic use by businesses, but also by the FIs financing these activities. But also harmonize sustainable finance taxonomies uh, to make sure that we all speak the same language and have a clear understanding which activities have a positive impact on plastic pollution and which need uh, the increase of financial flows towards too. If we can go to the next slide, please. So that was ahead of INC2, but now uh, we're uh, at the forefront of INC3, which will take place in November. And ahead of this round, third round of negotiations uh, for the future plastic instrument, we have published redirection financial flows to end plastic pollution. Uh, we all know that ending plastic pollution requires a systemic change, which should be facilitated uh, by the redirection of financial flows from all sources. Therefore, our paper describes how the treaty can enable this systemic change for finance and how the required redirection of financial flows can take shape. And we show possible pathways, how financial portfolios should shift from activities we should increase 
sorry, from activities, we should decrease financial flows to, to initiatives, which need an increase of financial flows. And if you go to the next slide, please. We have also made concrete reference to the zero draft. So that was already mentioned uh, during INC3, uh, the, the zero draft of the uh, plastic in future plastic instruments will be negotiated. Um, and we have concrete, we have made concrete references to this zero draft. So uh, on the one hand, uh, we welcome the provisions which are already made in the zero draft, uh, it looks very good. But from a financial institution perspective, uh, we think we, the future plastic instrument can be strengthened by um, mentioning the key messages and make sure that these key messages, as I just mentioned, are a bit more firmly embedded in the plastic instrument text. So that means uh, there are possible ways to strengthen the text. Could be on the one hand that the imperative of aligning the financial flows from all sources should be included in the objective of the zero draft. Uh, in the same way, as I just mentioned, as this is done on the Paris Agreement and the coming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework, uh, it proved to be very effective. On the other hand, we also want to include in part two of the zero draft, and part two describes the core obligations and the control measures, a new finance-related cross-cutting obligation to take measures to align the financial flows with objectives and the targets described in the future plastic instruments. Eh? This should help enabling also the private finance parties to align their financial flows too. If you can go to the next slide. Uh, we mentioned it many times, uh, how the, we should uh, redirect financial flows, but how can that take shape? As I mentioned, uh, as ending plastic pollution really requires a systemic change. So that means that we need to reduce uh, the use of plastic in the products we use, but we also need to take care of the pollution which is already caused, uh, such as, for example, the plastic in our oceans and in our rivers. But furthermore, we also need to focus on three important market shifts. Uh, so we should focus on accelerate the market for reusable products. And it was also shown in the in the uh, information you uh, shared uh, that this also the reuse models are underrepresented in the current investments, but also to accelerate the market for plastic recyclings. And last but not least, also to reorient and diversify uh, the market for sustainable and safe plastic alternatives. To realize this, a really massive change is needed. Uh, we all know this. This means we need to develop new business models. We need to develop new products, new recycling technologies, or for example, a new collection or new sorting infrastructures to make this happen. Each of these actions will need funding across the whole value chain. Uh, this can vary from a startup uh, who came up with a brilliant new technology to make sorting more effective, but it can also be related to a large corporate uh, who's in transition to more uh, sustainable business models. Each of those parties have a different level of maturity and therefore also leading to different financial needs. And to solve this issue, public and private finance actors have complementary roles to play along the plastic value chain, but they are both equally important to make this happen. And finally, also mentioned, the member states also play a very important role in creating the right enabling environment that to facilitate the systemic change and to make sure that in the end, uh, the economics work for the solutions to end plastic pollution. In short, I would say uh, we all need to work together to make this happen, public and private in all phases. And um, yeah, I would kindly invite you, and that's the next slide, to uh, read our paper. And uh, yeah, please do reach out in, uh, in case of questions. Thank you. And thank you, Joost. That was an excellent summary of what actually is in the paper that is downloadable right now from the UNEPFI website. And again, the title is Redirecting Financial Flows to End Plastic Pollution.
Now, dear audience, we have a terrific panel for you, and we will start with a small tour de table with the panel members. And um, our panel today is composed of three experts. And um, I will ask them each to describe in a short line what type of work they do at their organization. Uh, our panelists are uh, Anjali Acharya, Global Marine Plastics Lead at the World Bank. And she has experience across the globe, mainly focusing on North America, Latin America, and Asia, but a true global player, um, addressing topics in her work related to pollution, biodiversity, and innovation. I'll hand the floor to you in a minute, Anjali, uh, or Anjali. Um, we have Carlo Cavadon, he is Circle Economy Senior Financing Specialist at Intesa San Paolo Bank. He majored in political science, law, and international affairs, and he's interested or in working on topics related to innovation and finance. And last but not least, we have Guillaume Gra, Investment Director of the European Circular Bioeconomy Fund, sometimes abbreviated as ECBF. And he has experience with bio-based solutions, as is in the title of his fund. And in a previous career, he focused on uh, alternative protein, amongst others, insect protein. But now he's focusing on um, bio-based alternatives to plastics. So very happy to have such a expert level panel. And uh, as I said, Anjali, could you describe in one sentence what you do at the World Bank? In one sentence, um, I lead the work on marine plastics at the World Bank, engaging with countries to support uh, global analytics, uh, policy support, and investments. Thank you. Carlo, could you describe hello. for the audience what you do at Intesa Sao Paulo? Hello, Jan, and hello, everybody. Thanks for the invitation at Intesa Sao Paulo Innovation Center, which is a company of the Intesa Sao Paulo Banking Group. We, uh, I'm part of the circular economy team of the bank, and we evaluate uh, loans requests from our customers in order to provide them with the best terms condition. Uh, so we support the business units of the bank. On circular economy. Great. Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> Thank you. And... Um... Guillaume? Yes, so hi everybody. Um, at ECBF, we are investing in startup companies who uh, develop solutions uh, that are bio-based as opposed to fossil-based. Um, and we grant them capital. So basically we are investing um, ticket size of roughly uh, 5 million. So in total, we have uh, 300 million to deploy uh, into such uh, startup, and uh, our money comes from uh, large corporates uh, as well as from uh, the European Commission. Okay, so we have representation of public sector finance, private sector finance, and the banking angle and the investment angle. Um, let me get back to Anjali and start with a question. Actually, there were already questions coming in into the Q&A and we have tagged some for the panel. Um, but a question I'd like to start with, Anjali, is a very obvious one. How does the World Bank actually collaborate with governments on finance to end plastic pollution? How does that work? Thanks very much, uh, Jan, and I think uh, we're all collectively quite excited to go towards um, INC3, where I think uh, financing will be one of the key issues being discussed. So the marine plastics work um, aligns very closely with the World Bank's mission of uh, alleviating extreme poverty, because, of course, we know billions of people, especially the poorest, uh, rely on oceans. We have been working to support countries in all regions at every stage of the plastic life cycle. So it's completely the life cycle approach um, that is underpinning uh, the um, uh, zero draft as well. Um, we have a pipeline, uh, we have pipeline projects worth almost $2.5 billion with components focused on plastic pollution and prevention. And these range of, uh, span a range of different sectors from fisheries to tourism to river cleanup. And of course, a large number of projects that are aimed at solid waste management. Um, how do we finance this? Uh, a lot of the analytics is financed through ProBlue, a multi-donor trust fund, which is financing 
uh, strategies and investments. Um, what are we specifically financing? We are financing, uh, and this speaks a little bit to, to what Roisin talked about. Uh, you know, we're financing data on uh, marine plastic sources because we want our clients to be able to track pathways of plastic. How much plastic do they have? Where do they have? How much? What kind? We are financing game changer tools, and I'll talk about uh, one of them um, a bit later. Um, and this is really to help countries advise. I mean, all of you have talked about the importance of finance, but how do different countries assess how much finance they actually need? Uh, and that's an important point. And the financing they need will depend on the combination of policies that they uh, select. And the combination of policies they select will depend on their specific plastic context. So that's how they have to knit together, understand your plastic context, prioritize your policy, and then assess your financing. These are at the individual uh, country level. We're also supporting, uh, uh, Roshin had uh, mentioned specifically on, um, you know, a lot of the uh, the national action plans and, and roadmaps to phase out single use plastics. These are also policy support that we are providing to several countries. And then finally, we are supporting specific investments, as I mentioned earlier, but also at the regional level, we have two large uh, regional programs in Southeast Asia and South Asia, and a new one coming up in Africa, because many of these require regional solutions, not just single country solutions. Our sister organization, IFC, is also investing uh, in deals with the private sector. And some uh, About a year, a year or so ago, there was a $150 million uh, investment deal with Indorama, which focuses on PET recycling. So let me stop there. Yeah, that's excellent. And actually, that already raises some points that address what comes from the Q&A box. But um, one um, attendee was actually worried about the trillions of dollars of investment needs mentioned at the start of this webinar, that they would be all on the shoulders of the public sector finance or public finance sector. And um, we all know that is not the case. There is private sector finance needed, but how crucial is private finance uh, actually to the success of public finance? And would you dare to put a number to it, how much is needed? <laughs> uh, no, I would, I would not dare to put a number, but some of the previous colleagues have assessed the amount of financing uh, that is needed uh, altogether. Um, I very much agree with all the previous uh, speakers that this is a joint responsibility. Uh, it will require public and private sector to come together. Each of them have their own comparative advantages and each of them rely on each other to unlock that investment, unlock that financing. So from the public sector side, it needs to be really focused on trying to find the right policies to uh, improve the enabling environment to attract in private sector. Now, the transition to a circular plastic economy will require significant investment. We've heard already from, from Umesh and others about you know, investments along the entire value chain. We know that some of that investment needs to be redirected. A lot of it is much more downstream, it needs to be a little bit more upstream. Um, but each of these demands for finance have a very different profile, a different risk profile, uh, different economics, different owners, different capex to opex ratios and therefore will require very different uh, types of capital right you can't have just you know say that okay government will take care of this or private sector will take care of that and this is very unique to individual countries or types of countries now i just wanted to mention we have a new tool that we are putting together developing together with systemic and uh, yoni is um, uh, one of the attendees here today um and also with a group of partners, um, which aims to provide countries with an insight on how to connect finance demand and finance supply, because that's going to be critical, right? How do they connect that demand and supply? We have, um, this tool will really be tailored to country specific insight and recommendations, and it will build on some of the existing tools that assess their plastic context and the combination of policies that they want to uh, carry out. What will it do? It will help to quantify the total amount of investment, capex and opex needed for a given country by types of investments and under different scenarios. So this will enable mm -hmm. countries to say, okay, we choose this combination of policies. This is what it's going to cost. These are the likely uh, types of uh, investment scenarios that we can look at. 
It will also look at metrics about investment readiness of different asset types in different countries um, and help countries to understand what sources of capital, types of capital, and capital investments are best suited for the different financing needs. So clearly, there is a need for this to be also customized. There are global numbers, but then when you drill down to where, and I think uh, one of the previous colleagues talked about need for regional uh, distribution. Uh, so you need to have which countries, what levels of vulnerability, what types of investments they need, uh, and where can they go to find it. It's now moving away from the what do we need to do to how do we need to do it, and that how is very much embedded into the financing of it. Thanks. Thank you. And actually, when I was listening to you, I was also reflecting on one of the questions from the audience. One of your um, elements that you can play with or that governments can play with in their simulation of the financial needs is the income from a global plastics pollution fee or from a local um, plastics related fee. Is that correct? Is that one of the ingredients of the mix that you that these governments can play with in your tool? Um, we're still in the process of developing the tool, but you know, a global plastic fee will be applied globally. So we'd have to see what that plays out for individual countries. But sure, I think what we're trying to see is what kinds of financing is available uh, from the public sector side, from the private sector side, from philanthropy, etc. So looking at uh, you know options such as a global uh, pollution fee is also something that um, uh, can be um, investigated. And that can be part of the minimum viable product because that's what you're working towards and will be presenting at INC3. So very much looking forward to that. Thank you for sharing how to finance and how to simulate the investment needs of uh, governments, the public finance sector. And now over to Guillaume Gras, like bridging into the private sector here. Um, turning the tables here, because you're from the private sector, a venture capital fund. What can the public sector do to um, enhance your role as a private investor? Yes, so the, the public sector um, can help in, in many um, directions. Um, first of all, um, the, the public sector can give um, a regulatory uh, frame that helps um, corporates, investors, private uh, sector to know where they are going. Um, it's a sector that requires investment, so you need to have visibility uh, for the next five to ten years. This is very important, and I think this is the role um, of the um, public sectors. Um, also, to give the the also the incentives or, or the penalties that are matching with this uh, with this objective, we need to have uh, a lot of consistency between the the goal and then the, the incentive that are put in place. Um, the public sector can also um, help with um, the end of life of all these materials because we, especially, I mean, the kind of startups that we are investing in often brings to the market new solutions, new materials that are more sustainable, more bio-based, more recyclable. But in the end, they do not control the end of life of the product because this is very much in the end of the, the end consumers and then in the end of the uh, waste collection, collection systems. Um, so the public sector, sector can help with um, raising awareness to the, of the end consumer, improving the behaviors, but also uh, ensuring that there is the right infrastructure behind uh, to uh, collect, then sort, and finally recycle all these materials. A startup cannot do it. It has to be organized, and even large corporates would struggle to do it because it needs to have some kind of uh, common frame, uh, common uh, coordination. And this is where the, the public sector can help. Yeah. And lastly, of course, um, the public sector can help uh, with uh, financial incentives, subsidies, whatever, to make sure that some businesses that are struggling with profitability becomes profitable and therefore are able to attract private capital. Thanks. That's quite a complete answer. 
Um, actually, picking one from the Q&A that was directed at your investment scope, you are focusing on um, the bioeconomy. And one of the questions, if I read it well, was how do you assess, how do you do the due diligence that the bio alternative is not causing more pollution than the fossil based plastics? You must have had this question asked to you before. Yeah. Yes, yes. Very good one. So, um, the CBF is a so called Article 9 fund as per, as per the European uh, regulation, which means that we are an impact fund. We have to comply with the highest standards of sustainability, which means that A, we have to make sure that every investment we do is uh, reducing the carbon footprint. Uh, so that's the first thing. And then the second, there is a, a do not uh, harm principle, uh, which means that we need also to check if there is no uh, other consequences to our uh, investments. And this is, I think, the, the point of your question. What about the, the end of life? So we will always uh, look at um, the um, local uh, geographical context, because um, in some countries, and we are primarily operating in Europe, the uh, recycling facilities are quite advanced uh, compared to other geographies. But of course, if we know that, for instance, um, the, the, the materials will not be recycled because there is no proper infrastructure, then we would not invest or we would try to find an alternative. So this is a key concern and it has to be assessed on a case by case basis. But basically it's a, it's a commitment that we, we have as per our um, impact fund status. Yeah. So in summary, it needs to lower the CO2 footprint and also the do no harm principle needs to be respected. And you have due diligence on assessing the pollution effects of uh, alternatives. Thanks for sharing. Um, Carlo, you've been quiet up until now, but you are representing a bank that has a very special position because Intesa San Paolo in 2020 announced a 5 billion euro financial facility to stimulate the circular economy. And um, could you share with the audience uh, two things? Um, are you on track to, to meet your uh, target? Uh, <laughs> but also, uh, what is actually the plastics circularity examples that are contained in that 5 billion euro um, circular economy finance facility? Yeah, so to first to answer you, if we are on track, I need to provide you with a couple of additional information because the, the five billions um, facility that we call circular economy plafond is one of the two major tools that the bank provides to the customers. Uh, the other one is the circular economy lab, which is devoted to open innovation and startup scouting and advisory and training. So uh, two uh, instruments that can go in part, can work together and in parallel uh, to offer support to our customers. Uh, so that, uh, that um, facility, the 5 billion, was intended for the previous business plan of the bank, the business plan 2018-2021, and we had to extend to six billions, and at the end we disbursed more than seven and a half billions. So we were, and we 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 concluded the period uh, of the business plan fully on track. Now, uh, for the current business plan 2022-2025. Uh, the bank uh, renewed its commitment with uh, 8 billion um, credit facility. Uh, and well, uh, just last week, our CEO uh, shared the results uh, of the, to the 30 of uh, September. So uh, we already disbursed seven and a half of the 8 billion of this plafond. So I think this is my personal opinion, but I'm quite confident also to continue with my work uh, that we will extend this plafond uh, again because, well, there's momentum for circular economy. There's a lot of interest from our customers and for customers all around the world. Uh, Excellent. To, to provide you with a couple of quick examples, uh, if, if I can, if uh, very quickly. Well, we, we are supporting in the plastic sector as well as in every sector, um, companies that are uh, transforming their products or their business model. For products, some example can be moving from plastic straws to 
compostable uh, straws or com from uh, compost from plastic packaging to compostable packaging that is able to extend the shelf life of, of a product. So uh, as well as the more common uh, recycling business models that we already heard um, in the from the previous speakers. So these are very quick examples that we supported through the plafond, which is a credit facility. Excellent. So in summary, there's not only a financial facility, which obviously is very um, uh, numeric and, and very tangible, but there's also, so, so to say, technical assistance for SMEs to adopt their uh, business model to circular economy. And Intesa Sao Paulo has a lab to support that work. So very important work. Actually, I was curious, when you do the due diligence on your project, you mentioned just a few, but there are many, many more. How important are mandatory corporate disclosures on plastics? How much would be the value of Intesa San Paolo to increase its business in circular plastics when you have well, better data? <clears throat> well, the it's it's not important it it would be and it will be crucial to have mandatory disclosure on on, on a lot of data and topics like plastics um, because uh, so far uh, we were able to uh, to produce to uh, to produce tailor-made contracts with our customers so we were discussing with them we are discussing the day, every day with them to 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 define kpis so to define their commitment which goes into the contract, which is assigned by the customer, in order to um, to uh, to get some concrete results, and then to uh, present them the objective of our and then the scope of our um, investment of the of the loans that we provide them. So we have uh, the possibility to discuss with them so far, uh, having uh, some new. Uh, mandatory uh, data available would be a huge support for us in order to verify, to check and to discuss with them. In this sense, we also um, produced a white paper with the Alma Carta Foundation and Università Bocconi, uh, which okay. was intended to be a study of 2000, more than 2000 companies all around the world with public available data. And we discovered that moving towards circular business models, so towards circular economy in general, uh, can uh, provide two important effect one is the reduction of the probability of default of our customers and the other one is the uh, higher adjusted return on uh, on stocks of our customers so it's also more appealing for an investor a company which um, is moving towards circular economy thanks that's great actually um so the private sector very much calling out for more quality disclosures on plastics, which currently are not mandatory and uh, many corporates do not disclose what their packaging is made of and how many plastic volume is contained in their daily business. So that would be helpful uh, for a private sector company like you, as you explained. Thank you. Back to public sector. I don't know, Anjali, are you still with us? Because we're not able to see you at the moment or should we Keep the questions for last for you. I think Anjali just... No, no, sorry. I'm still here. I was having okay. some connectivity issues, so I cut my video. I'm here. Oh, that, 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 that's great. There are, there are some questions. I wasn't able to read the Q&A entirely. I mean, obviously, um, there's a lot of interest from the, from the audience. But one of the very basic questions was, does the World Bank actually assist all countries in the world with their tools to simulate the financing needs to address uh, plastic pollution? Uh, yes, we assist all of our client countries, uh, which means that uh, we don't particularly, uh, well, we're, we're also available to share with the high income countries, but the focus is very much on uh, middle income countries and lower middle income countries and low income countries, and as well as countries that are specifically vulnerable. We have a suite of tools um, and uh, other kinds of support that we provide. I also noted, uh, Jan, if I might, one of the questions, I think, which was from Malawi, um, on how can one go about um, uh, starting to look at circular economy um, issues in Malawi. And um, I think an important part of this was is really sort of looking to first 
um, understand the plastic context, like what are the main plastic issues, um, what are the, the main problems, um, what are some of the constraints, uh, then going on to identify the different kinds of policies um, that would address those issues. And then finally, um, looking at the financing question. And this is where um, we and uh, several of our partners who are here today um, are collaborating to bring together a suite of tools that would be able to help countries. But we do have, through ProBlue, grant financing available um, for, especially for lower middle income um, countries middle countries. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, I hope you're still able to hear me. I actually have a bit of a glitch in my video, so you're now watching the blue screen as I am probably, but I'm still here with you. So <laughs> we'll end the, <laughs> the uh, webinar as anonymous, but um, still with you. Actually, um, just looking at my list of questions coming from uh, the audience, there was a very explicit ask or question related to tracking and monitoring, which obviously ties into the disclosures that Carlo was talking about. But tracking and monitoring is most mostly post-fact. Um, Guillaume, could you say something, how you track and monitor the effects, the pollution climate effects of the investment uh, targets that you have in your portfolio? Is there anything that you could share with the audience on that mm -hmm. yeah so <clears throat> the companies we are investing in uh, are usually uh, small and are not directly um, um, covered by this uh, mandatory plastic disclosure um, but what we do see is that um, the large companies who um, have to take care and, and, and monitor their uh, plastic consumption, um, start then acting on it and start uh, looking for solutions. And this is where it gets interesting for, for us and our portfolio companies, because that triggers uh, opportunities for them to um, work with these large companies. Because until now, uh, it's it was difficult for them uh, as small companies with barely a solution or not very uh, mature solution to convince a, a large group to work with them. And uh, now that they have really a pressure to, to find solutions, they are much more open to collaborate with this uh, smaller company. So we see the indirectly the, the effect, yes. Okay, thanks. Um, Carlo, actually tracking and monitoring, that has to do with tracking the effects of the circular economy. I've seen some um, progress reports on circular economy. Is tracking and monitoring a key thing to communicate back to your investors at Sincesa Sao Paulo? And how do you do it? Uh, yeah, sure. It's uh, it's the the last part of all the discussion that we uh, that we have with our customers because well, we we need answers from our customers, so we need the results uh, as the, the contract also is, is uh, mentioning the necessity of providing evidence of the results as we support, we believe in our customers, but at the same time, we also ask for uh, the proof of what they are doing with the money. So to, to correctly use the money, um, first of all, in order to avoid greenwashing and, and things like this, but at the same time, we also have to report to our stakeholders the use that we do with the money of the bank so uh, we every every year we also have um, the, pro the possibility and the opportunity to share what we did what the bank did with the money as well as the customers did with the money so it's like a unique flow that we present to investors in order to uh, to maintain and to keep track of the all the effort and the commitment uh, our and effort commitment and our customers' efforts and commitment. So you don't have to imagine me with a an helmet going into a, a plant and check exactly uh, how much uh, uh, secondary raw material is being processed or if uh, there are tons of this of that uh, uh, resource which is being used or not. But we do have uh, the possibility to check with uh, mandatory disclosure documents or or sustainability report or and so on so we have a lot of tools to to check with this 
Thank you. And that actually concludes our panel. And I would like to thank the audience for their attendance and all the panelists and speakers for their effort. Um, thank you for sharing your valuable time with us. We are heading towards INC3. Um, INC3 is the third negotiation round on the international legally binding instrument on stopping plastic pollution. And we're looking very much forward to the outcome. We'll be back um, to share those outcomes with you. And now I'd like to thank speakers and panelists and the audience for attending. That's it for now and goodbye. Bye, thank you, Jan.